Good evening, and welcome to the Library of Congress. My name is Sharon Horowitz, and I'm a reference librarian in the Hebraic section. Thank you all for coming. Tonight's program is one of two programs that the Hebraic section is sponsoring in recognition of Jewish American Heritage Month. Our second program will be a screening of a documentary, Jews of the Wild West, on Tuesday, May 16th, in the Pickford Theater in the Madison Building at 6.30. The documentary maker, Amanda Kinsey, will be on hand for a question and answer session after the screening. Many thanks to the music division for allowing us to use this beautiful room, which is decorated with historic instruments, which you can see over there, uh, created by Antonio Stradivari. Uh, the systematic development of Hebraica in the National Library began in 1912 when a Jewish philanthropist named Jacob Schiff bought a collection of 10,000 Hebrew books, pamphlets, and manuscripts assembled by a book collector, Ephraim Dinard, and gave it to the library. Some highlights of the collection are that we have more than 230 Hebrew manuscripts that are currently being digitized, an extensive range of periodicals, both popular and scholarly, 900 Hebrew and Yiddish Yisker books, uh, Holocaust memorial books written by survivors of Jewish towns destroyed by the Nazis and of interest to genealogists. Uh, also, we have 1,300 original Yiddish play scripts. Uh, two of these are included in the small display of Yiddish Americana that's set up on the tables over there, and I encourage you to look at the display after the program, although you've probably looked at it beforehand. So, uh, Our work includes selecting books to add to the collection, lending books to other institutions, responding to requests for information, both online and in person, from members of Congress, students, professors, as well as the general public. An important part of our mission is to preserve and publicize our collections, and one way we do that is by sponsoring programs like this one. And now, a word about our speaker. Lauren Strauss is a senior professional lecturer and director of undergraduate studies in the Jewish Studies program at American University. Her PhD is from the Jewish Theological Seminary in Modern Jewish History. Her forthcoming book is entitled Painting the Town Red, Jewish Visual Arts, Radical Politics, and Yiddish Culture in Interwar New York. Her talk tonight is entitled Writers, Radicals, and Rugelach, Yiddish Culture in America. Professor Strauss will discuss how 19th century Eastern European Jewish culture was recreated in America in the 20th century, looking at politics, entertainment, newspapers, recipes, and more. One more item of business before we get to our speaker. As you can see, this program is being videotaped for subsequent broadcasting. There will be a formal question and answer period after the lecture at which the audience is encouraged to ask questions and offer comments. Please be advised that your voice and image may be recorded and later broadcast as part of this event. By participating in the question and answer session, you are consenting to the library's possible reproduction and transmission of your remarks. And now, finally, please join me in welcoming Professor Lauren Strauss. Good evening. Uh, it's really wonderful to see you all, and I'm also really amused because I said to my husband uh, on my way over that I didn't know if I would have a minion. Um, and uh, and here we are. So um, so it's really great to be here. It's always wonderful to be in this incredible building and, and uh, complex of buildings, really. And um, I love doing work at the Library of Congress. I love attending um, programs here. And so I really want to thank the library where I spent so many hours and uh, so many. Um, days and weeks uh, working on my dissertation research and other research. There's really nothing like it, and especially in the beautiful uh, spaces here. And, um, and I also uh, really want to thank Sharon Horowitz, who conceived of this and, uh, and invited me and remembered uh, from a very long time ago when I was doing work in the section. So uh, it's really wonderful to be here. And, um, and I'm also uh, thrilled that, that you're either interested or you got lost um, uh, in, um, 
caring about Yiddish culture in America. And so let's face it, um, history is hot these days. History is all the rage. It's in the news, uh, it's assailed, and it's wielded by friend and foe alike. Um, left, right, and center are using history, fighting about history, and um, discussions about multicultural America, multicultural, multi-ethnic America, what does an American look like? What does an American sound like and eat like? These are firmly enmeshed in these battles over history. And they are very serious questions. And in some cases, they're a matter of life and death. But today, in honor of Jewish American Heritage Month, I hope that uh, we'll all learn, maybe salivate a bit, um, and celebrate the transmission and the transformation of really a culturally rich and, uh, and colorful tradition that has been inherited by millions America of Americans, uh, American Jews, and also now many others as well. So the topic of Yiddish culture in America is broad, and I will only be able to touch on a few of the areas, but there's, there's plenty there. Um, and I'm um, happy to discuss more in our Q&A at the end. Uh, so I'm wondering, first of all, how many people here have some familiarity with the Yiddish language? Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> oh, the Yiddish Yisten. Um, and how many people here have ever been to a Jewish deli? <laughs> okay, see, it, it already, it, um, you'd say, in like the Jewish world, in Makarovs, everybody else, it like brings them, brings them in, brings them closer. Um, so I want to start by asking a question that I won't answer. The question is, why, yid, why is Yiddish funny? Why do people laugh when you even say the word Yiddish? People go, <laughs> as if they're anticipating something funny is, that is going to come out of your mouth. Uh, here we have, if you can't see the captions on the left, uh, we have a woman um, with two uh, people in tow who are there, I guess, to drag heavy stuff, and she's saying, Morris, here's your pipe and schleppers. So this is, of course, what my mother calls people that you hire when you're moving in and out of an apartment who carry your heavy stuff, they're schleppers. Um, and then on the other side, uh, he, uh, one man is asking, what does chutzpah mean? And the other guy says, give me $20 and I'll tell you. <laughs> So one of those chutzpah means uh, nerve or gall, but really it, it's kind of untranslatable. Um, of course, what is the classic definition of chutzpah? I'm sure some of you know this. Exactly. You murder both your parents and then ask for mercy on account of being an orphan. Um, exactly. So who ever thought of that? I don't, you get an A+. Plus. I have to say, I just finished all of my grades for the semester. Um, there is some more room in here if you want to come in. There are some um, seats in the window, the nice window seats with cushions. So please, I don't want you just hovering um, outside. Um, so where does Yiddish come from? Yiddish um, comes from, sorry for the dot matrixy uh, image here, it comes from, uh, we think, most recently, Eastern Europe, Eastern and Central Europe, but really the language is about a thousand years old. And the reason that it is a combination, it's one of many dozens, in fact, of Jewish fusion languages that are all a combination of Hebrew, <coughs> usually the Hebrew alphabet and some vocabulary, plus at least one other language, often more. Um, so the reason that Yiddish is a combination not of Hebrew and Russian, or Hebrew and Ukrainian, or one of the East European Jewish languages, but rather a combination of Hebrew and what? German, German but not modern German, medieval high German. Don't ask me to tell you a sentence in medieval high German. Um, the reason is that the Jews a thousand years ago, uh, that one Jewish community, of course, 
were living in the Rhine River Valley in areas uh, that we now know of as France and Germany. And for various reasons, like the Crusades and some other reasons, they began to move to the east. And they took that language with them. They had created this Jewish fusion language based on the surrounding uh, language of the people where they lived. And then as they moved, they took that with them. And so now, we, as we see on this map, the geographical distribution of the language uh, by the 19th century is that we have all of these different dialects, Northwestern and Central Western, Central Eastern, et cetera, with slightly different accents and slightly different uh, vocabularies. So that, for instance, um, my grandmother, whose family was from Ukraine, could certainly speak to my grandmother, who was from Romania, they totally understood each other. Doesn't mean they liked each other, but they understood each other. And um, and occasionally they would you they would have a different loan word. They would have a different vocabulary word for something thrown in. But you know, I, I try to explain to people it's kind of like Americans and Brits. We say truck, they say lorry. We say flat uh, apartment, they say flat. We say uh, elevator, they say lift. But you know, they sound better than we do, but, uh, but we understand each other. Um, so this is where the language is from. And so when the people moved uh, first west to Western Europe, and then many of them, in fact, most of the people who were leaving Eastern and Central Europe coming across the Atlantic to the United States, although we'll, we'll talk about that, um, uh, they brought with them different dialects and different traditions. They are, for the most part, at the end of the 19th century, what we call the Great Migration, this massive wave of migrants um, from the early 1880s to the early 1920s when in 1921 and then definitively in 24, the gates of immigration slammed shut to enter this country with the Emergency Quotas Act of 1921 and the Johnson-Reed Bill of 24. So in that 40-year period, most of the Jews who were coming to this country were coming from Eastern Europe and Central Europe. They are, of course, <coughs> also coming from places like the Ottoman Empire, but just to give you a sense, there are about over two million Jews coming from Eastern and uh, Central Europe, and about 20,000 coming from the Ottoman Empire during that time. It is the age of great migration, not only of Jews, but of every people from everywhere around the globe coming to this country in that period. There are about 25 million people who migrate to the United States uh, from the early 1880s to the early 1920s. And the Jews represent about 10% of that migration. And so that is huge when you consider, you know, how many countries they're coming from and also how small the Jewish population is relative to the rest of this country. It has never been more than 5% and is usually around 25 or 3%. But they're coming for different reasons. And unlike most of the other migrants, they are coming with the intent to stay. And they're, for the most part, coming for two reasons. They are uh, coming from the shtetlach, the shtetls, the small or medium-sized uh, Jewish towns and small cities, which doesn't mean that they are entirely Jewish. You can have a town that's half Jewish and half not Jewish in Eastern Europe. Um, but here is one example. This is a rather nice one. When I show this picture, I generally explain in, in this area that this uh, I would call the Potomac of shtetlach. Um, <laughs> It's kind of big houses, roomy, but unpaved streets. Um, and, uh, and a lot of the life there is still fairly primitive. At this point, in the latter third of the, uh, of the century, you have already had a, a shift so that people, especially young people, 
uh, from Jewish families in the Shtetlach are leaving their small towns and they're going to the cities, often to the industrialized cities, places like Warsaw and Krakow and Lodz. And they are, especially the young people, are working in the factories there. They are away from their parents in many cases, so that means they're away from the traditions, they are becoming more secularized, they're meeting other people, and since it's the end of the 19th century, many of them are becoming radicalized politically, and they're learning about Marxism, socialism, and they are part of the proletariat, and they are absorbing all of that. So, um, so there is a combination, when you talk about the Jewish population, that is coming here, it's really a combination of those young, sort of secular, uh, left-leaning people, much more traditional people, and not at this point Hasidim, or ultra, so-called ultra-Orthodox, or Hasidim or Haredim, um, people who you might envision with um, uh, long black coats and hats, the men and, and beards, and uh, the women, well, all women wore dresses at the time, but um, covering their hair, et cetera. Uh, for the most part, especially the Hasidic community did not come until after the Holocaust, until after World War II. Uh, there were definitely observant Jews coming in that earlier migration, but not from those communities for various reasons. So they're leaving for two main reasons. One is, and really the primary reason, although this is not the first reason that people will give you, is extreme poverty extreme debilitating poverty that is hard to imagine in this country. Um, children dying of malnutrition every day, um, maternal mortality rates that are very high, disease, diseases like uh, tuberculosis and cholera, when there's a cholera epidemic, and, uh, and other reasons as well, a high rate of conscription of Jewish boys um, at a very young age into the Tsar's army, for all sorts of reasons. Those are, according to immigration historians who uh, look at um, papers that people filled out giving their reasons for leaving, that is actually the primary reason. Then on top of that, the reason that most people, and especially most sort of American Jewish descendants of these migrants will give you, is violence, is of course, the pogroms, the anti-Jewish riots that begin to sweep across the, um, uh, especially the Tsarist Empire, but other places in Europe as well. In the early 1880s, uh, there is a major wave that happens right after the assassination of Tsar Alexander II in March of 1881. Um, and those are terrible pogroms, among other things, they jumpstart the immigration movement, they help to jumpstart the uh, modern Zionist movement, and they also really um, imbue a lot of people who stay there with a uh, revolutionary ethos, and they end up becoming very involved in what would later be things like the Bund, the Jewish uh, International Jewish Labor Organization. So this is a formative, formative time, the early 1880s. You then have another wave of terrible, unspeakable violence from 1903 to 06, uh, most famously um, in Kishinev, the capital of Bessarabia, the famous Kishinev pogrom in 1903, and, uh, and then another much more destructive wave of pogroms in 1919 and 20 as a result of following the uh, breakup of the empires following World War I as a result of the civil war between Ukrainians and Poles. So whether you were a Pole or you were Ukrainian, it was bad for the Jews, sort of the way it worked out. Um, you have also um, other, uh, other aspects of the culture, though, that are reflective of these trials and these periods of change that are coming across the ocean with the millions of migrants who come. Some happier um, aspects of that culture, like the work of Sholem Aleichem, the oh, Sholem Rabinovich, the best known and probably best loved Yiddish writer of the 19th and early 20th century, uh, although he is um, he has stiff competition with uh, Yud Lamed Peretz and and Mendel Amochus Forum and um, and other names that that you would know if we had more time and we could talk a lot about 
Jewish literature. And, uh, and Sholem Aleichem, though, stands out, and I mention him here for two reasons. One is because his works, uh, most famously, his creation of a simple dairyman named Tevya. Um, no, he did not write Fiddler on the Roof. Fiddler is a Broadway adaptation of the Tevya stories. Um, so Tevya and his many daughters bring to life many of the trials and tribulations that these people are living through in, uh, in their homes in Europe. And then they bring those stories and they also bring that kind of idea of pegging it all to literature and to art with them and, and as we'll see into the growth of Yiddish theater and Yiddish literature in the United States. So this, um, this very warm, this affection that the people in this community have for their writers, for their people who they feel are part of what they will call amcha, like the, the, the people really from the, the salt of the earth people. Um, and Sholem Aleichem epitomizes that voice of writing about the people's tribulations, about the pogroms, about the changes in the youth, secularization, about mobilizing, about people being arrested for being revolutionaries. You have all of that in his stories. And then the other reason I mention him is that he himself came across the ocean to New York, twice actually, came earlier to escape the Kiev pogrom that he endured in 1906, then he went back, and then at the end of his life, he came again right before World War I, started in 1914, and ended up dying in New York and is buried there. And just to give you a sense of how this affection and, and his reading public came uh, across the ocean as well. This is a newspaper photo from the uh, funeral procession after Sholem Aleichem's funeral in May of 1916. And there were reportedly over 150,000 people. Um, the processional started, um, I forget which way it went. Um, I think it, yeah, it started in uh, around Harlem, which was uh, really growing as a Jewish neighborhood and then went all the way down Manhattan, and then, of course, the streets were most clogged in the immigrant neighborhoods of the Lower East Side, and then his casket was taken out to Queens, where he is now buried. Um, and so that is just, you know, what the tip of the iceberg, how people really embraced their cultural figures. Now, people, um, Jews, non-Jews, are coming over on these large ships, this is a very famous photo by the American Jewish, uh, German Jewish and American photographer Alfred Stieglitz called the Steerage. And this is taken on a ship in 1907, which was the height of immigration in that period. And about uh, 11,000 people a day were coming at, at the height into Ellis Island. When Ellis Island opened as a processing center for immigrants in the 1890s, it was thought in their wildest dreams, they could not imagine more than 5,000 people a day uh, trying to come into this country through one point. And I say this very, very aware of the fact that tonight, uh, May 11th, um, for other reasons, the, the borders of this country will once again um, be tested and, and our uh, capacity to welcome immigrants will again be tested. So what's old is new again. And, um, and here we see the, uh, the first and second class passengers literally looking down underneath in what was called the steerage. And, uh, and that is where most of these immigrants rode. And why do you think it was called the steerage? Who was supposed to be in that area of the ship? Cows, Cows. right. It was meant for animals. It wasn't meant for humans. This, by the way, represents a great advance over the ships that were used for uh, migrants in the middle of the 19th century, uh, like the Irish uh, immigration after the potato famine and the German Jewish immigrants, those were called floating coffins. So this is an improvement. Um, 
But uh, this is how many tens of thousands of people are coming in to Ellis Island primarily and also other ports of entry up and down the East Coast and, uh, and some other places as well. They uh, disembark from the ship and where do they go? If they are Jewish immigrants, if they are Irish, if they're Chinese, if they're Italian, where are most of these people? What, what part, what little dot on the globe gonna end up? The Lower East Side, right. So the Italians will go to Mulberry Street and Little Italy, and the Chinese will go to Mott Street and Chinatown, um, and, uh, and the Jews will go to um, Grand Street, Delancey, Orchard, of course, Hester Street, and, uh, and on and on. This would become, in short order, the area of densest, not only Jewish, population on Earth, but the area of densest population on Earth, period. Um, this is just one view of the Jewish neighborhood in the Lower East Side. <clears throat> and you see the vehicles are in the street, the people are in the street, the peddler's carts are in the street. People were run over every day, children would dart uh, back and forth in between the, the, the wheels, and, um, and there was just an ever-present crush of humanity. Um, the wards, New York is uh, separated into wards for politically, et cetera, and the wards that uh, had the Jewish um, neighborhoods in them, so wards uh, 9, 10, and 13, were the, the, the most densely populated areas. People uh, slept during the summer, people slept on the rooftops and on the fire escapes because often there were 14, 16 people in an apartment and it was not unusual for people to have boarders, people paying renters in their apartment and some sleeping there during the day if they worked a night shift and some sleeping there at night if they worked a day shift. Um, constant, constant crowding. Almost all of them were Yiddish speakers. Almost all of them came from and brought this culture with them. This was a living culture. In 1897, there was a census taken in the Tsarist Empire, the all empire census or something, and there were a number of questions asked, and one uh, was asked, what language do you speak? What is your primary language? Ukrainians spoke Ukrainian, Russians spoke Russian, Georgians spoke Ge Georgian. Jews were often multilingual, they needed to be, but the number one language, the primary language was Yiddish for what percentage of people in the, in the Tsarist Empire, you wanna guess? 14% spoke Yiddish as their, pop, as their primary tongue. Don't be shy, 60, 100. So according to this census, 97.5% of Jews living in the empire spoke Yiddish as their primary tongue. And this represented about five and a half million people living in that area, the Pale of Settlement that I showed you earlier, which was a, an area to which Jews were for the most part restricted for about a hundred years until, uh, by the czars, until the Bolshevik Revolution. So, um, so that's why most of these people, when they're coming to this country, they're bringing Yiddish with them. Where are they living? They are living in tenement houses. <coughs> This is, I'm cheating here because these are from the, they've since changed their exhibit, but the wonderful Tenement Museum on the Lower East Side did such a good job and they were in color, so I decided to use them instead of only, uh, only amazing photographs by, by Jacob Reese. Uh, people are living in these tenement, these so-called tenements, the, uh, the apartment houses, apartment buildings that are usually uh, average about four stories high. And as I said, there's great overcrowding and you see the uh, fire escapes 
um, et cetera. People uh, would throw their, uh, their garbage, the slop from dinner out the window into the air shaft in between buildings, so then they would become rodent infested. Um, obviously, there's no air conditioning and there isn't any indoor plumbing until uh, the th after the turn of the century. Um, not only were the majority of these immigrants living there, but they also worked there. And they worked often in the tenement buildings or in factories, both large and small. And what was the number one industry that most Jewish East European Jews worked in? Garment, Garment industry or the schmatze the schmatze industry, the garment trade, making clothes and making everything that went with clothing. So the hats and the decorations that went on the hats and the buttons and you had the person who was the buttonholer. That was their profession. They made buttonholes. Um, and you had, uh, you had different parts of garments, of ladies' garments especially. So you had the shirt waist which is the sort of the, the shirt part of a dress, but it was removable in case you stained your, your, the shirt part, you wouldn't have to throw out the whole dress. Uh, shoes, everything. They each had um, their own workers, and here we see in a Jacob Reese photo from that time, we see the inside of a sweatshop. Um, and we also, uh, we also see that uh, the, the overcrowding is there. People are living there and working there. You know that this is the inside of a Jewish family's home because the, the artwork on the, on the wall above the workers, that the big one is um, probably a ketubah, a Jewish marriage contract. Um, and, uh, and as I said, at some point, over 90% of Jewish immigrants would either be in the garment trade or uh, uh, working as peddlers in the streets or both, uh, switching off. And as a result, they were radicalized further, many of them who had come bearing this uh, socialist ideology. Um, and as a result of, of various events that we'll get to in a second, uh, they would really be loud and the rest of the country would really know that they were there, that their presence was there. But not, not to say, this is not to say that they had a negative view toward being here. People did complain. If I could sing, I would sing to you the, the wonderful Yiddish song, Columbus, uh, of A Curse on Columbus, which I'm sure some of you know. Um, but, but really, at the same time that they're working so hard and, and in these overcrowded conditions, people in this community are embracing the idea that they're here and embracing the idea of America to the extent that we have here a Yiddish-English translation of the U.S. Constitution from 1902. This is only one of the uh, really whole library's worth of materials that were prepared by the Jewish community to welcome the immigrants and to educate them. This is what your new home is all about. They didn't just read this in their leisure time. This would become the, the Constitution, other government documents, um, books of history, of American history, would become an integral part of the culture, of the Yiddish culture of downtown New York and other urban centers like Chicago, Philadelphia, Montreal, Baltimore, in which the institution that best absorbed these immigrants and really taught them about uh, not only life in America, but taught them sort of survival skills, um, how to write a letter, how to apply for a job, were the settlement houses, were two things. The settlement houses, which uh, were not an exclusively Jewish invention. Uh, famously, you may know about um, Hull House in Chicago and Jane Addams, um, but they were really 
taken up by the Jewish immigrant population. They really ran with this idea, and they built these centers, often built, by the way, by earlier migrants, earlier Jewish migrants from the uh, Central European migration, um, usually called the German migration, which is a, an overgeneralization, who were more established, had more money, and they would build places like the Educational Alliance on East Broadway and the Henry Street Settlement and University settlement and in those places they would uh, they would teach them civics they would use materials like this they would teach them history but they also would teach them about art and theater and um, and and English literature and they had all of that translated into Yiddish but they also wanted them to learn English that was probably the number one uh, number one effort that they're making so you have this kind of um, push and pull at the time you must learn English, you must acculturate, you must become part of this society, and they did. But also, there are so many of you that we have to prepare the materials to do that in Yiddish. Um, as I mentioned, many of the immigrants would also, on the side, not only learn about the way America was supposed to be, but they would get themselves involved in making it what they wanted to be. This is why I'm so interested in radicals and artists. These are the people I'm writing my book about. Um, so this is just one of hundreds, probably thousands of images that I could show you. This is by the artist Ben Shan, who was born in Russia and, and uh, came here. He did this later as a, a scene from his childhood. Um, and this is called East Side Soapbox, and you see that it's a man with a Yiddish sign uh, behind him that, it, that is, uh, has sort of um, socialist uh, pro-worker slogans on the sign. And he is making a speech. He's organizing. He's organizing people in the neighborhood and telling them that they need to stand up for their rights. And indeed, the, uh, the Jews on the Lower East Side and also going all the way up Manhattan and, uh, and increasingly in the Bronx and, and Brooklyn and in other cities as well would become the leaders of the labor movement, certainly the labor movement in those places. They were less involved in um, sort of heavy industry, in organizing heavy industry in the Midwest, uh, like steel workers, et cetera, although they, they did some of that. But in the light industries, the garment industry, cigarette making, match, uh, making matches as opposed to matchmaking, um, <laughs> also important. Uh, they, uh, the, the Jews who had this uh, socialist ideology would be in the vanguard of almost every labor effort. We see here, for instance, um, striking workers, and these are all young girls. So they're almost entirely young, uh, Jewish, Yiddish-speaking, or Italian girls, young women working in the garment industry who are brought into the labor movement with leaders like Clara Lemlech and, uh, and all of the Roses, Rose Schneiderman, Rose Posada, they, all the rest of them are named Rose, um, and uh, Rose by every other name. Um, so uh, they are inspired. They are told that their lives are only going to be better if they organize and they make them better at their own peril. So these photos are of the great uprising of 1909, 1910, the so-called uprising of the 20,000, where led by Clara Lemlich and others, they walk out. They they organize a walkout of approximately 450 of these sweatshops and small factories in the garment industry where they have been working 12, 14, even sometimes 16 hour days in the high season preparing for uh, the next season's clothing without a break and without fresh air. They get tuberculosis. The girls are sexually harassed by bosses. And, as we'll see, worst of all, probably, although that's pretty bad, 
the uh, the bosses generally lock doors and windows so that so that uh, workers cannot leave until they say so, and I and even then they only are allowed to leave through one exit, and their bags are searched because God forbid they may have lifted a scrap of cloth. Uh, as um, many of you well know, this resulted in. Uh, tragedy on March 25th, 1911, with the Triangle Factory fire, in which 146 workers, I'm not going to show you any gruesome photos, 146 workers, almost all young Jewish and Italian women, there were about two dozen men, uh, would die partly being burned, partly smoke inhalation, but mostly either being crushed or having to jump out of 8th, ninth, and 10th story windows to escape the flames because the doors and windows were locked. That would be the, the worst workplace tragedy in this country until September 11th, 2001, in terms of loss of life. And, um, and so this is uh, this is a tragic coda to the end of their strike in the cloakmaker strike because this strike ended with about 400 of the 450 uh, shops signing an agreement to not do those things anymore. One of the shops that refused to sign the agreement, which was called the Protocol of Peace and was brokered actually by a labor lawyer from Boston who came down from Boston named Louis Brandeis. Um, uh, one of the shops that refused to sign that document was the Triangle Factory. and. Uh, it wasn't only in the garment industry that we saw activism, though. Um, could talk uh, about a lot of other issues, but I'll just mention one. This population, especially the women, were very um, active, unusually active, in the movement to allow information about contraception, birth control, and even abortion access and access to women's health surrounding reproduction. Um, of course, that was illegal, something called the Comstock Laws, which I almost had a car accident when I was driving last week and I heard somebody talking about bringing back the Comstock Laws of the 1870s, um, <coughs> which forbade even the mention of contraception in literature um, that was going through the US mail. That was considered pornography and you could be arrested for distributing such information. I know, imagine that. So our trusty radical, Emma Goldman, uh, called by many the most dangerous woman in America, a confirmed anarchist, um, uh, eventually deported from the country during the first Red Scare of 1919 and 1920. McCarthy was the second Red Scare. Um, Emma Goldman, among other things, was uh, very involved in in trying to disseminate uh, birth control literature. Here she is addressing a rally. Um, and you can tell by the hats that most of the people there are men. Um, and uh, she was absolutely fearless. She went anywhere. She didn't care if she was arrested. And she worked closely for a while with Margaret Sanger um, on, on this issue until they broke over other things. Um, now, a, a uh, talk on Yiddish culture would, of course, not be even close to complete, and it's, I'm not, um, without, uh, without bringing up one of the most important figures in Yiddish culture in the 20th century in America, and that, of course, the man, the myth, uh, Abraham Kahn. And here we have two views of him. Um, first, as a young radical on the left, uh, right after he had arrived in this country the previous year, 1882. Um, and, uh, and then in his uh, older years, except that he actually lived much longer than this, uh, and I think he died in 1951 when he was in his 90s. So Abe Kahn, among uh, many other things, I mean, he was a novelist, he wrote short stories, he was an organizer, he is best known for being the founder of the Yiddish Daily Forwards, the, the most renowned and uh, widest circulation Yiddish newspaper uh, ever. Um, and, uh, and he founded it in 1897, 
uh, interesting big banner year for the Jews. That's the same year as the First World Zionist Congress, and it's also the year that the Bund was founded. So he had just come uh, from the Russian Empire to this country when a few years later, in 1886, so he's still really a, a so-called greenhorn, a newcomer, um, in Chicago there was a, uh, there was a massacre of, of uh, it's complicated, but there was a massacre called the Haymarket uh, Massacre and um, where some demonstrators, anarchists and left-wing demonstrators throw a bomb and, uh, and policemen are killed and the uh, people who are arrested, who it's not at all obvious that they were the people involved, are, um, are put on trial and are executed the next year. So this figures very prominently in the memories of Abe Kahn, of Emma Goldman, of other newcomers to this society. And they decide to make their mark uh, in various ways on society and Abe Kahn, of course, does this through the press. He joins the uh, first the English language press and he learns from some of the best known muckraking sort of yellow journalists of the, of the age people like Lincoln Steffens, uh, Hutchins Hapgood. And he, uh, and he then goes, and at the end of the century, with uh, some other people, he founds the Yiddish Daily Forward. Uh, of course, that wasn't a Yiddish word, but he made it up and called the Forwards because he's a socialist and he wants to give the sense of progress, a moving forward. And he didn't want to call it something like Kadima in Hebrew. And so he, uh, and so he creates the Forward and it is a juggernaut. Uh, almost immediately, its circulation begins to grow. Um, in 1912, you see on the left there the very top of the forward building or the forwards building, which uh, I believe still stands um, in the Lower East Side. It is now condos. Um, and, uh, and you see the, the banner um, uh, name on the top. And around the periphery of, of the top of the building, you have uh, Marx, Engels, LaSalle, and figures like that who are important to socialists because the Forward was a labor newspaper. So this is in concert with everything that I've been saying about this population. However, not everybody who was a Yiddish speaker in Lower Manhattan was a socialist or was part of the labor movement. So this is an incredible time in the first and second decades of the 20th century when there's just an explosion of Yiddish literature. There is, um, by the 1920s, um, Morris, uh, Moses Rishon, the, the great uh, historian, just passed away a few years ago, counted six daily newspapers in Yiddish, four of them published in New York City alone and dozens and dozens of other publications, monthlies, um, small chapbooks of Yiddish poetry, uh, plays, and, and other, um, other illustrated, uh, illustrated works. And, <clears throat> and it's just really an incredible, incredible uh, sort of um, fruitful time for Yiddish literature and for um, Jewish readers in general. How did they do it? Initially, people brought over from Europe hand-cut um, blocks of Yiddish and Hebrew type, and initially you had people typesetting um, the, uh, the, the words, and also eventually you have typewriters. This is Isaac Vesheva Singer's typewriter in later decades, his, his Underwood. Um, so there's a whole culture there that's growing. By the 1920s, you would have a dyed-in-the-wool fierce competitor to the Forwards, although its numbers never ever even approached the numbers of the Forward, uh, which had approximately a quarter of a million subscribers. A quarter of a million subscribers, which of course meant many, many more readers because people would share the newspaper. And also, there were shipments of the Forwards and some of the other literature going back in the other direction across the Atlantic, being sent to Bialystok and Warsaw. But their great rival on the left, but on the farther left, the so-called Die Linke, were the, uh, were the communists, the Yiddish-speaking communists. 
and, um, and uh, exemplified by the newspaper, the Freiheit, which was founded by the Yiddish-speaking wing of the Communist Party in 1922, and then it became the Morgen Freiheit later in that decade. Now, these illustrations are not from the Freiheit. Uh, they are, because the, the quality is very bad uh, visually, um, these are from a, uh, a publication that's very near and dear to my heart, as Sharon knows, uh, Der Größer Kundes, which uh, I studied when I was a graduate student here in this very building, um, because they have a wonderful collection of them in the Hebraica section. So Der Größer Kundes, which is an illustrated journal of satire and humor in Yiddish, and it means, the title means, the big stick. Um, and it, the, the masthead shows these sort of um, clownish figures um, tickling people's noses with a feather and doing all kinds of naughty things. Um, but they also took their politics very seriously. And they are, if not communists, very leaning toward that. And so here are some sample illustrations for you of the De Grusser Kundus making fun of Abe Khan, who was their arch enemy. Uh, they hated him more than they hated anyone in the right wing, more than they hated non-Jews who they didn't let, you know, the, the worst was the closest to them. And so here in the cartoon on the left, they're saying essentially that Abe Khan isn't a real Marxist. They show him as the janitor in his building sweeping up pictures of Marx and, uh, and other figures and putting them in the trash. And then we have on the right a very sad, mournful Karl Marx leaning with his elbow on the top of the forward building um, that I just showed you and bemoaning the fate of socialism under Abe Kahn's tenure. Um, they could also be very serious, though, and the, the primary illustrator of Der Grosser Kundis, uh, Lola was his pen name, also memorialized the victims of the Triangle Fire. So, for instance, here we have on the left a, um, a cartoon from right after the fire in 1911 with um, the, the man seated and chiseling the headstone with wings on is labeled Father Time. And he is writing uh, this headstone and dedicating it to the anonymous victims because there were some who were never identified. And, uh, and the mourners are, um, it's called Das Yiddische Volk, the, the Jewish people. And then on the right, um, you have a, um, a signifier that uh, three years later, people are now still mourning, but they're more angry than anything because this, this cartoon was published after a civil lawsuit um, was completed um, against the owners of the factory. And uh, they had, by the way, gotten off of any criminal charges. And so they were sued in civil court. And the, um, the upshot of it, the, the settlement was that the owners would pay $75 a head to the families of the victims. And so we have this, uh, this very dark, sardonic cartoon with the road to money, the road to the bank, where you see the dollar sign there is paved with the skulls of the victims. So we, we really have a lot of, um, a lot of texture, a lot of the, the color and the emotion that, that is associated with this whole community coming out in the Yiddish culture of the time. Um, on a happier note, though, one of the most famous elements of Yiddish culture at that time, and I'm happy to say uh, being revived today, is the Yiddish theater. Oh, oops, sorry. Um, that is... Uh, oh, that's a Yiddish dance hall, and and uh, that's from the movie Hester Street. Sorry. Um, and here is the Yiddish theater. Here is actually Yiddish vaudeville. So vaudeville at the time is the most popular uh, form of stage entertainment in America from the post-Civil War era until the 1920s. Um, and uh, until bigger sort of follies, like Ziegfeld's Follies, uh, really come along. And, uh, and until film really gets going with Nickelodeons in the early part of the century. 
the Yiddish vaudeville, and it literally says, if you can read the Yiddish, vaudeville uh, in Yiddish letters, um, this is, uh, this kind of takes over um, the imaginations of many of the entrepreneurs who are working on the, what would come to be called the Yiddish Rialto uh, on Second Avenue in New York. And you have this replicated not only in New York, in many of the cities in America. So you either have these uh, established Yiddish theaters that are there and that are the locus for visiting troops of first vaudeville performers and then uh, and then serious actors and less serious actors in these Yiddish theaters or you have um, you have sort of a storefront that changes depending on whether somebody is in town or not so if you're in a kind of a smaller market you might not have the permanent fixture that you do here um, Yiddish theaters though especially in New York but also in Philadelphia and uh, and Baltimore and Chicago and and Montreal and other places are really big affairs and there are um, at this time dozens of dedicated Yiddish theaters that are just um, for the purpose of showing a combination of what is called shund or sort of trashy things that were considered very lowbrow sensationalist, um, kind of scandalous theater, and also the, the higher brow stuff, either things that were um, written specifically for the Yiddish stage, like you see here, this, this poster from the Talia Theater, the, the one in the middle you see, it's uh, Shlomo HaMelech, um, King Solomon, and, uh, and then under that, in the red letters, um, the, the title is Bar Kochva, talking about a, a Jewish uh, historical hero. These are works that were written specifically for the Yiddish stage and for the Yiddish going public. But you also had, um, in these huge edifices, like here, the Jacob Adler Theater, named for one of the most popular actors on stage, you also had um, people going between, eventually, the Yiddish stage and the screen, a growing, uh, growing um, industry of Yiddish filmmaking that started out uh, both here and in Poland, and for sort of obvious reasons, uh, after the late 1930s, I believe 38 was the last um, Yiddish movie, feature film, in, that was made in Poland before the Holocaust. But this industry is really flourishing with stars like the, uh, the darling of the Yiddish stage, Molly Pecan, and uh, uh, probably best known as Yiddle Mitten Fiddle, which uh, was used for the ad for, for this talk. Um, and, uh, and you really have this expanding to include not only people who are fluent in Yiddish, and not only Jews, but you have uh, people from uh, so-called uptown, <coughs> people who are either non-Yiddish speaking Jews, who are more acculturated or assimilated, and also non-Jews who are coming down for the local color, for a sense of being in this incredibly vibrant uh, theater where people call out and yell at the actors and, um, and have a real sense of familiarity. Um, and they de definitely do not stand on ceremony. They will, you know, famously when Jacob Adler is sick with a cold and he has an understudy and it's announced from the stage that he's not there because he has a cold, apparently many women sent buckets or containers of chicken soup to his house the next day. So there's this, this sense of familiarity that it's not only uh, you know, something that, uh, that you watch from a distance. Um, and that also would, believe it or not, um, really spill over into screenings of Yiddish films as well and the film stars. We even have translations um, or productions of such famed Yiddish playwrights as William Shakespeare, or William. And uh, they're on the right, and, uh, and on the left, the Yiddish HMS Pinafore by Gilbert and Sullivan. Now, I purposely included King Lear because of all of the Yiddish productions, certainly of Shakespeare, King Lear, it was King Lear 
a tragedy that really struck the deepest chords with many of the Yiddish-speaking immigrants. A tale of a man who uh, is out of his element and is set, sent to wander and is exposed to all kinds of dangers and has three children but makes a very big mistake and has two rotten children who all they care about is their new riches and their new lifestyle and they turn against him. This clearly just struck a chord with many in the immigrant generation and the, um, the, the, the gap that was really opening up between the newcomers uh, and their parents. So you hear this a lot. You also um, saw uh, productions of newer plays like um, Anski's The Dybbuk, which, by the way, was that last film made in in uh, in Poland in 1938. It's an incredible film, and it's hard to watch because most of the people in the film stayed in Poland. Um, and uh, and and Anski's uh, Dybbuk was revived here, and a whole new audience. This is seeing it, not only seeing Yiddish culture from this deep place of affiliation, like the uh, an identification, like the immigrants watching King Lear, but also from people coming from the outside, as I mentioned, and um, and looking at it as art in general and as theater in general, not necessarily only uh, for people who had uh, gone through the immigrant experience. So uh, we have here just one more example of the opening night of uh, Yiddish theater here. And this is, this is kind of late. This is already 1940. So the reason I say that that is late is that by 1930, especially because the gates closed to this country in 1924, for the first time in over a century, by 1930, the majority of America's Jews were native-born Americans. And for the first time, the majority of America's Jews spoke English as their native tongue. So this, of course, has a real impact on the development of Yiddish culture. What is it going to stand for now? Who is going to really relate to it? Will anyone still, will it disappear? So uh, you see here the crowds um, for this opening night of a movie starring Maurice Schwartz, also someone who made that transition from the Yiddish stage to film. But, um, but there are many other venues, many other, uh, other forms of media that Yiddishists turn to to try to reach their community and also soon to address some other problems as the Holocaust, um, uh, news of the Holocaust grows and, uh, and there are other priorities. Um, one of these really popular methods of reaching out to the community is the Yiddish radio and Yiddish radio hours that are uh, probably um, best known on WEVD in New York. And does anybody know what the station, um, the station that speaks your language, that was their tagline. Um, uh, and it was founded as the, the uh, radio station of the forward, of the Yiddish forwards. If any, who knows what WEVD stands for? Yes, <laughs> Eugene V. Debs, exactly. Not a Jew. Um, but the leader of the socialists um, in, uh, in America who ran for president four times, including running for president, from his jail cell. And so he's really idolized. And this is, uh, th this is, the, uh, this is how the Yiddish, th that's not the only Yiddish radio. That's one of um, several Yiddish radio stations. Um, so we have here um, people, you know, getting, it's one of the funny things about radio, it was only over the airwaves where people got all dressed up uh, and even had, had props and had costumes, et cetera, to, um, to, you know, speak and sing into the radio. And you had uh, ads that are wonderful. If you can find it, the most wonderful thing that I think NPR ever produced is uh, Henry Sapoznik's uh, special on the Yiddish radio stations um, 
through, uh, really through many decades. And uh, Henry Sposnick, who used to be the, um, uh, one of the, the sound people um, at uh, the Evo Institute, which I'll talk about in a minute, collected wax cylinders and all of these very old um, products of original radio uh, programs and somehow found machinery to play their uh, to play the shows that, that had been created on them through the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And there's a, a wonderful NPR special, um, multi-part uh, multi special that came out a number of years ago with that. So one of the um, tasks that Yiddish radio will have to take on uh, after the war, as the war is ending though, is making announcements of names of missing relatives in Europe and announcing names, trying to reunite people, trying to at least find out what happened to people or asking if somebody was from a certain town, if they could tell someone what had happened to their town. And so it's not only a matter of art and entertainment, it's, auto, uh, it's also a matter of creating community and preserving community. And uh, so it has an awesome responsibility in, uh, in that regard. Um, after the war, no matter how radical, no matter how um, cheeky people may have been toward Jewish tradition and the Jewish community before the war, um, most members of the Yiddish-speaking community would join together in things like this, the uh, annual Warsaw Ghetto commemoration here in the Bronx coops or co-ops uh, at the end of the 1940s, and they would also um, print and survivors of various uh, small towns printed and published books. And I know Sharon mentioned that there is one in the little display that she created on the side there um, called Zichonisbecher, or memory books of communities, of towns in Eastern Europe. And these were uh, published in Yiddish, in English, in Hebrew, sometimes bilingual, um, and so, again, this is a, a way that we see that Yiddish culture is being transformed and it's still partly very much alive, there's still a lot of entertainment, but it is also looking backwards and, and looking uh, over the ocean and, and trying to provide some kind of um, refuge and comfort. People involved in Yiddish culture, uh, especially on the left, but not exclusively on the political left, wanted this, um, this in-depth uh, sort of love affair with the language and culture to survive into another generation. So among other things, they created summer camps, like here we have Boiberic on the left, Kinderland on the right. Anybody here go to Boiberic or Kinderland? Uh-huh. I had a feeling there would be some people. Um, and um, the people are very, very dedicated. Uh, and, uh, and so people, children went to, uh, went to summer camp and they learned the Yiddish language. They sang Yiddish songs. And they had their meals in Yiddish in the, in the dining hall. And um, if they were socialist camps, they called, sometimes called each other chaver or comrade. Um, and learned all the good, you know, workers' songs. And they also continued it during the year with after school shulas or, or schools. Now, shul is also the Yiddish word for synagogue, but you would never, never mix up which children are going to shul <laughs> and which children are going to shul. Um, so the Yiddish shulas are, uh, many of them are left-leaning and secular. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from somebody who grew up in the, in the Bronx co-ops uh, that were these, and still remain, these huge, huge edifices with courtyards that were built by the labor unions toward the end of the 1920s. Um, somebody there uh, who grew up there said to me, oh, we celebrated all the important Jewish holidays, May Day and Paul Robeson's birthday. <laughs> um, so if you don't get it, you don't get it. <laughs> Never mind. 
Um, so, you know, there's really a, uh, a generational um, ethos there, and people really are growing up, not only speaking the language, but being imbued with this idea that they, that, that they are the torchbearers of, of Yiddish culture. Now, uh, spilling over into the, uh, the rest of America, though, um, most people didn't go to the Yiddish theater or even watch Molly Pecan, but everyone eats. And so that's why I asked about Jewish delis before. Um, this would be probably the, um, one of the, the two main ways that Yiddish culture filters out into kind of mainstream America. The other one, of course, being through stand-up comedy. Uh, moving from the so-called Borscht Belt or the hotels in the Catskills Mountains, um, where uh, pretty much all of the stand-up comedians were Jews who came from a uh, Yiddish immigrant background. Um, people like Mel Brooks and, um, and Sid Caesar and Woody Allen and uh, Joan Rivers and Lenny Bruce and on and on and on. Stand-up com comedy was definitely created by that population. But the other way, easier, because it can be anywhere, is food, is the Jewish deli. Now it's dinner time, so I'll just show you a couple slides to make you hungry, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, you have to have next to your, I don't know, is that pastrami or corned beef? Okay, thank you, I don't, eat, I don't eat it, so. On rye, of course, maybe with a little mustard, never mayonnaise. Okay, and of course on the side you have to have some pickles and Dr. Brown's. Now that looks like root beer, but you know, what, what, who, what do the hardcore people drink? Celery soda. I still don't get it. Who makes soda out of celery, really? So Dr. Brown, celery soda or cream soda, there we have root beer. Um, and. Um, and you have all kinds of delicacies, knishes, which were reportedly invented here. That is the, the claim of Jonas Schimmel. Um, and, uh, and you have, um, you have Gus's Pickles um, and Essex Street, this immortalized in movies like Crossing Delancey with Amy Irving. And, um, and this, is, this is the way that people, first in big cities, and then um, really throughout America, um, would be introduced to the, the, at least the gastronomic aspects and many of the words and many of the cooking methods, really, of the uh, people who are part of Yiddish culture. Um, I had to include Ratner's cheese blintzes and onion rolls. And finally, of course, some rugluch. Right. Are you hungry yet? See, I even brought you dessert. Um, the, uh, the whole um, sort of um, culture of going to one of these delis, deli, uh, the, the meat part certainly, not created by Jews, but by German immigrants uh, to this country. The Jews sort of ran with it. Um, the, uh, the, the whole experience isn't only about the food. It's not only about raising your sodium levels to dangerous levels. Um, but it's also about the waiters and about the menus. And it's always about, I remember when I was little, when Ratner's still existed, the waiters would yell at us. And my parents, who wouldn't have uh, accepted that in any other restaurant, loved it. That was how it was supposed to be. If you recall what I said about the Yiddish theater and, and this level of familiarity, this is, to teach you a Yiddish word, a Hamisha culture. It's a homey, informal culture. And, uh, and so if you would order something, in Ratner's and many of the other, there's Yona Schimmel's if you want your knishes, there's Russ and Daughters, the, the original, or I think it's not even the original, it's the second one. I can't even afford to walk in there anymore. Um, and I don't think Shapiro's Kosher Wines exists. Um, you have to get the full experience, really. And so that's how um, 
that's how the, the Yiddish culture aspect is being transmitted to increasingly to tourists and other people. You have signs that are created. I don't have a picture of Katz's, uh, but Katz's has this signs that are created with what I call fake Hebrew. Um, which is that font that is actually English letters that are made to look like Hebrew. So it's a you know it's a whole it's a whole ethos. These days we have something that is I call not your Bobby's deli food. We have artisanal uh, Jewish deli food, and you have that you have grotesque creations like you know jalapeno bagels and uh, things like that. So, um, but, the, but, the, but the idea remains the same. This idea of choosing, picking and choosing different, um, different parts of the menu, if you will, of Yiddish culture to transmit either to the next generation or to people outside your culture because as ethnic has become cool uh, in this country, Jewish food and especially sort of Yiddish inflected food and now also Middle Eastern food is, um, is, is very, very sort of hot. So my question is that um, I'll leave you with just for the last few minutes. Um, where, if Yiddish lived in the Pale of Settlement and in Eastern Europe um, 130 years ago, and if Yiddish lived in the Lower East Side at the turn of the century, and then in the Bronx co-ops in Brooklyn and Brownsville where my father was born, uh, which was about 85% Yiddish speakers uh, when he was growing up even in the 30s and 40s. If Yiddish lived there then, where does Yiddish live now? And it's sort of a trick question because one answer would be here, certainly. Here's Hasidic Williamsburg. Here are the, uh, the, the descendants of the remnants, really, of Hasidic uh, Jewish communities that were completely decimated in the Shoah, or you'd say in, in Yiddish, the Chorben, or the, uh, the Holocaust. And they came to places like Williamsburg and Crown Heights and, uh, and New Square, uh, New York, or the Skverer Rebbe, he's from Nuskver, and other places, Borough Park, of course, and they, 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 they planted themselves and they grew, and, and their communities are now flourishing, and Yiddish is flourishing. A friend of mine just today was in Williamsburg, and he's a Yiddish speaker, he's a secular Yiddish speaker, and he went in to a bookstore to buy a Yiddish newspaper. He's also a professor, he teaches, he went in a newspaper. He said, Lauren, there were four different Yiddish newspapers. Again, like I told you about at the turn of the century, four different newspapers, although all of these, because of where he is, are, are Hasidic. They're all, you would say, from or religiously observant, more so. And he said there are children's books all over their entire stores of children's books in Yiddish for the kids there. And there are cartoons and there are movies and there are toys that are labeled, their boxes are labeled with Yiddish. It's a whole world there and in places like Curious Joel in upstate New York. Um, but you also, at the same time, have two other often overlapping sort of addresses for Yiddish. You have academia, yay academia. Um, so uh, you have here the Yiddish Scientific Institute or YIVO, which you see on the left, its original digs in Vilna where it was founded in 1925 and thank God moved most of its materials in 1940. Um, so most of them are in New York in this incredible place called the Center for Jewish History, the red brick building on uh, 16th Street between 5th and 6th Avenues in New York, which uh, combine five uh, scholarly Jewish institutions under one roof. YIVO is one of them. And so there's YIVO, which runs, among other things, the famed Zuma program, which I was a student in, and most of my uh, colleagues who know Yiddish studied at some point in the Zuma program to study intensive Yiddish there, or you can study Yiddish through what used to be called the Workman's Circle or Arbiter Ring, now the Worker's Circle. 
And also, um, you can go to the Yiddish Book Center in Amherst, Massachusetts, where books are collected and, uh, and really rescued. Um, and, uh, and I'll uh, get back to the, the book center in a second. You also, though, have new versions of, uh, um, of things that were just discussed at the, at the, uh, earlier in the century as sort of a pipe dream. Um, classes everywhere. This is a 1907 ad in Yiddish proposing that Yiddish should, could be in universities, being taught as actual classes. And here is one example from the 40s of that beginning um, in UCLA. Today, uh, according to these numbers are from um, 2021, there are uh, at least, uh, let's see, at least um, 30, over 30 universities that teach Yiddish to their students. 24 in America, five in Canada, 17 in Europe, um, uh, one in South America, a couple Israeli, Asian, Australian, oh, I'm sorry, 50, 50 universities, looking at the wrong number, um, with thousands of people taking these courses. So, uh, so it really is not a pipe dream. Who is taking these courses? Academics, sometimes singers who like to have a Yiddish repertoire and want to understand the language, and a whole lot of people who are either not Jewish or they're curious about Judaism or they grew up as very um, acculturated or assimilated Jews and they don't know sometimes how they feel about Israel um, and, uh, and they want something to identify with and a also a large subset of those are um, self-described, um, sorry, this is the, the new forward, are self-described as queer. And queer Yiddishist um, is a very, very big, uh, very big uh, kind of subset of new students of Yiddish in the academy and in all of these summer programs. Um, and uh, here we have a greeting card, Oy Vezmir, you're queer, uh, on one side, and Ich bin Freilich, I'm, I'm gay, with a rainbow flag. You also have these really uh, sort of hipster millennial um, uh, creations that are very kind of out of the box and not academic, like Yiddish Farm uh, here in upstate New York, and, um, and up there something called Yiddish Book or Yiddish Week, where people get together to sing and dance. There is something actually sponsored by the Yiddish Book Center every summer called Yidstock, like Woodstock. <laughs> And Yidstock lasts for days and has Yiddish performers and thousands of people take advantage of these, uh, of these offerings. Finally, you have, uh, you have Yiddish back in the sort of purview of people um, in the rest of society uh, with crossovers. People like stars, really, like um, Daniel Kahn, uh, who, if you have never heard his Yiddish translation of Leonard Cohen's uh, song Hallelujah and some others, and, and Woody Guthrie, This Land is Your Land, it is really to die for. It's, it's just incredible. So look up Daniel Kahn and his rendition of that in Yiddish. And Yiddish is back on stage. So what goes around comes around, and a... Um, an earlier work by, um, by the, uh, the writer Sholom Ash, who wrote a very, very racy um, play called God of Vengeance, Gott von Nekoma, uh, that uh, tried to open in New York in 1920, but the entire cast was arrested on opening night for, again, obscenity charges. It involves lesbian romance and all kinds of other things. It talks about a brothel. It was uh, reworked by Paula Vogel, this brilliant playwright, and was a hit on Broadway um, a few years ago and right before the pandemic, and it actually won a Tony Award and is put in this framework of actors trying to put 
this uh, play on, and then um, they are sort of sucked back into the Shoah and, and into the Holocaust. Um, have to end on a happy note, though. And the, the happy note is, uh, of course, in terms of, in terms of Yiddish theater, we have the incredible, not revival, but creation of Yiddish Fiddler on the Roof. And the reason I say it's not a revival is because Fiddler on the Roof was written in English. Sholem Aleichem wrote in Yiddish, but the Broadway show in 1964 and the film in 71 by the way, starring who as the matchmaker? Molly Pecan. Um, that was all in English. So the incredible success of Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish in New York, uh, which uh, kept being extended and is now heading to Broadway, is really, um, is really evidence that this culture has not uh, disappeared, but has just transformed into something very Yiddish and very American. So finally, um, I want to quote uh, in that vein the, uh, the words of someone who is the president of the Congress on Jewish Culture, the Congress on Yiddish Culture, and his name, which should tell you something, is Shane Baker. Now, Shane Baker is a nice Episcopalian boy uh, from, I believe, the Midwest. And he is an actor, and, uh, and he's, a, uh, he's many things. An actor, he's a translator. And he fell in love with Yiddish. And he's the president of the Congress on Yiddish Culture. And what he likes to say, he likes to quote a newly popular joke. Um, saying that one attraction of learning the language for many of the young people outside of Hasidic Williamsburg, um, for the young people who are studying, singing, and acting in it, is the following idea. Speak Yiddish, red Yiddish, so that your parents won't understand what you're saying. <laughs> So thank you. I'm happy to take some questions right. now. So, but, uh, I think it's not on. Hand. Can, I think it's so on. If you Can you hear me? Yes. So raise your hands if you want to ask a question. Behind you. Mic to you so that it will be recorded on the film. Right behind you. Uh, <coughs> uh, the name of the actress is Emma Goldman. Is that right? Uh, why was her, her main audience for that speech been? I don't know. Okay. Uh, because uh, she she was probably she was speaking downtown, and they were probably at work. <laughs> and and they're the ones who could vote in 1912. It's a good question. All right. Barefoot and pregnant. <laughs> yeah. So I was curious about something to a point that you said uh, before, and also. About a year ago, I read David Katz's book, World on Fire. And so specifically, I don't know the culture, but specifically to the language, speaking to Yiddish, right? Mm -hmm. I was sort of curious, because by the Chassidim, they still speak Yiddish, and they always, and they've in anything, the Satmarov, when he came to, uh, you were saying, Williamsburg, they didn't really, they were Hungarian Jews. A lot of them didn't speak Yiddish, and, or the Yiddish wasn't as good, I think. And so I was sort of curious why, by the Chassidim, why they continued and why there's so much. And over here, we get the books we get. A lot of them are Hasidic and a lot of them, yeah. they produce so much. Whereas by the it secular or, or non Hasidic Yiddish mostly disappeared, at least in terms of like written language and such. That's what I was curious right. about. Right. I mean, that it, it didn't disappear, depending on what, uh, what area you're talking about. It's a really good point. So the um, Hungarian Jews are really interesting uh, because they, some of them were among the most assimilated uh, Jews in Europe, um, uh, often in Budapest, and, and, and they tended to speak uh, German primarily, uh, the, the assimilated ones, and, and secondarily Hungarian. Um, and then, uh, and then the, the, what is Feldman? Um, uh, and then the um, uh, the Hasidic communities like the Satmar, who were mostly just decimated um, in in the Holocaust, uh, many of them did speak Yiddish. Uh, they spoke a different 
kind of Yiddish. Um, and so the people who came here, though, the, the Hasidic Rebbe's who were the heads of various communities did reconstitute many communities in this country, but they couldn't do it exactly the way that they were formed in Europe. Um, they, uh, for instance, uh, communities that were either geographically close to each other in Europe or that were um, ideologically similar combined and you had people sort of merging, you had communities merging and taking account of how many were left and and then uh, if, if there was an, a really ascendant leader in one community, sometimes he would take smaller uh, Hasidic communities like into his purview and they would just be merged. So in, in that um, in that process, uh, you know the the language also became standardized. Hasidic Yiddish is different from academic uh, Yiddish that, for instance, like the Yivo um, uses. And when I started learning Yiddish there and I went proudly uh, home, my grandparents were still alive and they just started laughing and making fun of me and saying, you know, you're home in the Litvak. Um, we, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we, have, we have a Lithuanian Jew here and my family is not at all Lithuanian. But that's the kind of um, that's the kind of academic sort of highbrow Yiddish that's been adopted by a lot of academia, um, and uh, and so what's interesting is that people who do research in the Hasidic community who are themselves sort of academics from from the ivory tower often have to learn Hasidic Yiddish terms and you know and it's not that hard uh, eventually but but you're right that it that it is a very specialized Yiddish and it's a really interesting history that goes along with really having to reconstitute the uh, the communities in general after the war and also reconstituting the those languages um, so I think those are Thank you. It was really, a really great talk. And at the very beginning, you talked about languages like Yiddish that used Hebrew letters, but they were not Hebrew. So I, I can think of Aramaic, but what are the other? Ladino is probably oh, the Ladino best known. Hebrew letters. Yeah, the, oh. the, uh, the best known besides Yiddish um, that is <coughs> still spoken today, Ladino being the main language of Sephardic Jewry. And so that's a combination of Hebrew letters and Spanish, uh, Spanish vocabulary and Hebrew vocabulary. Um, but there is, there's Judeo-Persian, there's Judeo-Italian languages, there are Judeo-Indian languages, mul multiple ones, not one Judeo-Indian language. Um, I heard a, a lecture by a, um, uh, by a linguist who studies Jewish languages and he, he said that he stopped counting at, uh, when he got to, I think, three dozen. And um, there, there are so many. There's Judeo-Greek and Judeo and other forms of Judeo-Spanish that aren't Ladino. And, um, and a specific Judeo-Roman dialect that only the Roman Jews spoke and the other Italians spoke different. Um, so uh, I don't, I so mean, I could, so I could uh, tell you. There's, a, there's an institute uh -huh. of uh, Yiddish, of, uh, sorry, of Jewish languages. Yes. And the person who's in charge of that institute, her name is Professor Sarah Ben Orr from UCLA. And you can Google her and yeah. find out. Yeah, she's great. So she has a whole map of all these mm -hmm. languages, what's yeah. endangered and what's not. And right, right. So her last name is B-E-N-O-R. So uh, Yiddish also got into the general community, non-Jews, for example, I remember recall reading a, a biography of Colin Powell, mm -hmm. and he worked for a Yiddish shoemaker, I believe, mm -hmm. and picked up Yiddish that way. Mm -hmm. and then you had some entertainers, Wayne Newton, Connie Francis, who picked up some Yiddish. Jimmy Cagney. G Jimmy yeah. Cagney. So there were, you know, it, it went across the boundaries of just the Jewish world right. as such. Yes, definitely. Um, that's one other. I think we have a question in the back. There were a couple. Okay. <laughs> Go back to the beginning when the, at the start of the 1880s, when the migration starts. Um, 
I happen to have an, a good friend who's a colleague of yours at, at AU who whose specializ specialization is in that. And there was conflict between the old German Jewish community that had already been established here for 30 some odd years and the newcomers. Uh, the, the, the German Jewish community would, you know, say they, they'd fund these institutions, like you said, but fill in the but. What was their attitude? But they didn't did want it? you marrying their daughter. Right. <laughs> 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 fill in the but, so to speak. Right, right, absolutely. I mean, the, the subject of the so-called the Russians and the Germans, which are generalizations, is is a uh, very, very interesting subject. I mentioned Moses Rishon, who was one of the first scholars to really write about that um, in his book, The Promised City. Yeah, I mean, look, you know, they, they were culturally very different. There were clubs that were restricted clubs where only German, uh, Central European Jews could belong and uh, East European Jews were not allowed to belong. Um, but, uh, but, but when push came to shove and there was a, uh, a human need and a, a material need, they also created uh, a lot of institutions that, that benefited their, their uh, evolution. Thank you for this amazing celebratory talk today. I learned so much from you. Um, I did come a little bit late, so I, I had one question. I'm sorry if you mentioned it at the yeah. beginning, but how many estimated Yiddish speakers are there today? And this is actually a two-part question. If you could also go a little bit into some of these other cities that you were mentioning, uh, Montreal, Baltimore, and this was very New York-centric. Yeah. Um, is there this re revival happening right. across those cities now as well? And oh, yeah. But I first estimated yeah. speakers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've looked for estimates, and it's um, definitely an inexact science, I've seen anywhere from one to two million. Um, and, uh, and the estimate is that about half a million people and growing uh, speak Yiddish at home and exclusively, and it's their entirely their language, including um, Hasidic Jews in Israel. And, um, uh, and then the others either, you know, speak it and other languages or study it, uh, et cetera. So, um, so that's like the, the sort of gross estimate of numbers. Um, and in terms of other cities, yeah, sorry, I, I always kind of end up apologizing for talking about New York a lot, but numbers are numbers. And, um, and uh, in those years of immigration, about 75% of Jews who did come through New York area ports of entry stayed in the area. Uh, so it was New York by the, by around 1930, New York was the largest Jewish city in the world. Uh, anybody know what number two was? Warsaw, exactly. Uh, now it's Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, I don't know. And so, um, so there are, uh, there are at, at, at that time, there are many um, either, you know, institutions uh, like the Yiddish stage and uh, the, the after school system that I mentioned, the Yiddish shulas, uh, and also summer camps, all of those things are happening elsewhere, not only in the East Coast, but in the Midwest and uh, in California and in the South. Um, but, uh, but it's, you know, it, it, it really the sort of the heartland was the Northeast, but now it's not anymore. So now um, with the advent of especially the internet and now in the last three years that we've all become so Zoom friendly and, and that you know we all know how to, uh, how to Zoom everything, I actually was corresponding with the uh, director of education at YIVO and I was asking him this very question um, about the enrollment in the summer program, the Zoomer program that I mentioned. So he says that, you know, there used to be like three levels and it was a six week program and there were maybe 15 or 20 people in each class, sometimes 25 or 30 in a crowded year. So he said he, uh, since 2016, he said in 2016, in that summer, they had 47 students. In 2019, but the last time before the pandemic, there were 75 students. 
So it was really growing. Then the pandemic hit, and he says we took the entire program online and had uh, 90 or 100 students. And by now, he said, we offer two full summer programs, one after another, um, and uh, or one they sort of overlap, one in person and one online. Uh, and in person is about 80 students, and, and they don't even know, they're not sure about the numbers online. And that is only one institution, that's only the Evo. Uh, there's Worker Circle, which um, has a, a lot of y Yiddish instruction. There are various universities. Um, you can now take uh, online Yidd Yiddish online at uh, through the University of Maryland. Um, that's open to all, apparently all Big Ten schools, so all those Yiddish football players. <laughs> um, uh, and... Uh, and right, right. Um, and uh, and now the University of Michigan apparently uh, has online Yiddish programs as well as some Israeli uh, university. I think you can take it maybe through the Hebrew University. I'm not sure uh, online. And also you would study in Paris. So it's pretty incredible. Um, I think one one more or two more. Oh, right, of course. Um, but isn't that the one that you have to apply to to be, it's like competitive to be an intern? Oh, okay. Okay, they have a lot going on. It's amazing what's going on. It changes all the time. There's somebody back there. Yeah, someone in the back of the room. Also. Hi, uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, you. Could you talk about the relationship between this Yiddish culture in America in the late 19th and early, or the 20th century uh, with Judaism? Uh, did it tend to be preser like preserving tradition or neutral or rejecting tradition? And were the Jewish radicals like the socialists and the labor movement, did they see themselves as promoting Jewish values or rejecting Jewish values? They didn't talk about Jewish values. <laughs> the radicals in the labor movement. One of the, one of the sort of um, anachronisms that that is uh, very popular um, is for people to look at, like the subjects that I write about, these radical Yiddishist artists uh, in the interwar period, in the teens and twenties and thirties, and say that they were practicing tikkun olam. Never did that phrase pass their lips. <laughs> they were not doing this because of some, you know, because they went to like a reform summer camp and and they played guitar and like sang about civil rights. They were true radicals. Many of them were anti, very anti-religious, and, and they were anti the religious establishment. Like like really one of the primary uh, artists I write about is William Gropper, who was like the most radical artist, and he um, he hated the rabbinic establishment, etc. And and most of them would not have described themselves as Jewish artists, even, and certainly not religious. Not trying to transmit re religious or Jewish values, but but they were in the forefront, in the vanguard of every movement uh, for what we would today call social justice. They were in the forefront of the, of the movement to release, to free Sacco and Vanzetti uh, in the 20s, and the Scottsboro Boys in the 30s. They went out west and, uh, and visited with minors um, and uh, marched for minors' rights. They marched against fascism and they, uh, they promoted um, people who wanted to fight for the Republican side in the Spanish Civil War. And Republican meant something different in the Spanish Civil War. It was the anti-Francisco -Franc uh, Franco side. So they would never say themselves, you know, this is what we are promoting, we are promoting Jewish values, but they were completely immersed in social justice. They were the radicals. And then as you get sort of like uh, to the kind of the normal people, you know, sort of the, the common like Jewish person walking around, I would say that there's often, including people who are ideologically left wing, a mixture. Um, most kitchens, were they kept kosher. 
Um, and uh, people, if somebody died, ex unless you were a dyed in the wool, what they would call a free thinker, unless you really, really like that was, you know, the, the hill you wanted to die on. Um, most people who were socialists, if they lost someone, would want mourner's Kaddish, the mourner's prayer said for them. Um, you know, there were these Yom Kippur balls, these, these balls with music and dancing and food on Yom Kippur that um, some of my colleagues love to talk about. And they are colorful and they did exist. But for the most people, most sort of, you know, average East European Yiddish speaking Jew, even the workers were not quite that radical. Uh, so, you know, it depends who you're talking about. So I think we're actually yes, out we're of time. Yes, we're out of time. Thank you so much for staying. Thank you. And if, if you want to get in touch, by the way, I'm happy to answer any more questions. You can just email me. It's easy. Strauss at American.edu. That's it. Good night. <laughs>